tax season is here, and if you're like most of us, you have more questions than answers. Joining me now to answer some of those questions is Jaden Evanson, a Lethbridge Charter professional accountant and a partner with Volution LLP. Welcome to Bridge City News, Jaden. Thank you. Happy to be here. Now, many people today just use tax software to file their income tax returns. I've been guilty of that myself. I've been doing it for about 20 years. But often, it can be worth hiring a tax professional to do the preparation for you. Why is that? Maybe we'll save a little more money? Um, sometimes it can be money, right? There's a lot of credits to be aware of. And the fact of the matter is, is that the government introduces new things every single year. We've seen that a lot this year, especially with COVID. I think the main reason that it's really nice to have a CPA on your team is just peace of mind. That you don't have to worry about it. There's no stress. You know it's taken care of. You know that you've got a professional on your side. I think that's the biggest benefit that we offer for personal taxes. And how about when personal income tax needs to be filed? Uh, when is that again? What's the date? So April 30th is the date that everybody knows about. Um, everybody's very familiar with that. Now there is a catch. If you are a sole proprietor running your own business, you have until June 15th. Now the catch is you have until then to file, but if you owe taxes, your payment deadline is still April 30th. And if you don't pay by that date, the government will begin charging interest on that date. Ouch. Now, with so many people working from home, Jade, in the past year due to COVID-19 restrictions, the lockdowns, what can people claim as work from home expenses? I'm guessing maybe some utilities, some of your rent or your mortgage? Yeah. So it used to be if you're an employee working from home, home office claims were really, really restricted. With COVID, the government's really opened that up. The simplest one right now is what they call a simplified working from home. It's a temporary flat method where you record the number of days you worked from home in 2020 due to COVID up to a maximum of 200 working days and you get a $2 per day credit. Very simple, doesn't require any special form, any special math, nothing. It's a per day credit. Now you can take that a step further. You'll need a form from your employer, a T777S or a T2200. If you have one of those, you can do a bit of math. You can pull in your utilities, internet costs, a couple of little things, you get a percentage of your home office space, and then that can be your claim. Depends on which one to do. One's very easy, one's more complicated, doesn't necessarily mean one's better than the other. Now, I'm told there's a special benefit for those who earned $75,000 or less than 75 k and collected a COVID-19 related benefit. Can you explain that? Yeah, so if you have earned $75,000 or less in 2020 and you collected the CERB, or the CRB or a different form of employment insurance because of COVID, what happens is the CRA is waiving all interest charges on any taxes you might owe until April 30th, 2022. The reason being is CERB didn't have any taxes withheld. So a lot of people who normally get refunds are having to pay taxes. The government's acknowledged that and said, okay, we'll give you a full year interest-free to pay that off. Now, I think with the job losses that came along with COVID-19 and the pandemic, many people tried to start up a lot of their home-based businesses. We're seeing that more and more today, Jaden. What are some of the things that we need to be aware of that we can be claimed or claim as business expenses or write-offs outside of what we maybe already touched on? So business expenses, it's pretty vague, actually, what you can claim. The general rule of thumb is if something helped you earn business income, then that's a business expense. Obvious ones are advertising, right? You're paying money to try to get new clients. Office expenses, if you have to print things off, it's an obvious one. But then you've got use of home, use of vehicle, use of your cell phone, use of your home internet. Anything that you did that helped you earn business income, there's a potential for a write-off there. However, you have to make sure that you're doing your research, make sure that you're being conservative. You can't say 90% of your internet use was for business. Don't forget, we all spend time on our phone at night just goofing off. We have to be aware of that, that it's being used for personal use as well. So we can only take a portion of those. So when would it make sense for a small business owner, maybe somebody who's a sole proprietor, to maybe expand things and set up a corporation? Now, there's some costs associated with this, but also some advantages as well, correct? Absolutely. Now, corporation versus sole proprietorship, that's a discussion that I could talk about for, oh gosh, easily an hour. Lots of things to consider about that. Now, a few rules of thumb. Corporations are great if you have a high risk business. If there's a high likelihood of being sued, of having to attend court, of having insurance claims, corporations are fantastic for that. 
Corporations are also really great when you are earning more money than you need to live off of personally. If you leave money inside of the corporation, there is a lower tax rate that will allow you to invest more back into your business. If you're a sole proprietor, you're paying full personal taxes on everything you earn, even if you want to invest it back into the business. And I guess you can really protect yourself as well legally if you have a corporation as opposed to a sole proprietorship because somebody could actually sue you as a sole proprietor, come after you in your house, where the corporation, I guess you're, there's a little bit of a buffer there. The corporation's protecting you, correct? Absolutely. And that buffer is a huge reason to set up that corporation. Now, doing that, you do want to make sure you're working with a lawyer and doing it right because if, you, if that error is significant enough, you personally are still liable. You're not magically protected because you had a corporation, but it can definitely help in those situations. Now, now, if somebody made a mistake when filing last year's tax return, or maybe they forgot to claim a benefit, can that be fixed somehow? Absolutely. The government allows us to actually fix up to 10 years of prior tax returns. Wow. That was instituted a few years ago under the fairness provision. So we have up to 10 years that we can look back. And I've done that before. I had a client, we looked back at, the full 10 years and realized that there were some mistakes made with their donations. And we got them a refund of over $18,000 because they had missed a number of credits. So it is worth taking a look. And if you're not sure, it is actually something that you can go and talk to an accountant about and get them to review it for you for a lower fee than it might cost to just have them file your taxes. $18,000. Well, wow, that would come in handy right now. Now, if a person normally receives money back from the government after filing taxes, whether it's $18,000 or not, is there a way to arrange things with your employer and the government so that they can maybe have less taxes deducted from your paycheck next year? You know, that's a really good question. And the answer to that is it depends. And just as a quick aside, it depends is probably the most common answer I give to questions. It just, everything depends on so many factors. Employers are required by law to withhold a minimum amount of tax. And it's based on a few factors. Uh, if you've ever gotten a new job or got a job recently, perhaps you remember filling out a form called the TD1, where it lists all these personal credits. Now, some of the personal credits you can list on there are if you have a spouse that's not working, you can claim the spousal amount. That will help reduce the amount of taxes withheld. But if you make a lot of donations, you cannot put that on the TD1 form. Your employer cannot reduce the amount of taxes withheld. Now let's talk about some of the charitable tax donations, whether giving to the church, giving to the Lord, giving to some nonprofits like the Canadian Cancer Society, the SPCA, Heart and Stroke Foundation. How beneficial is this to donate to nonprofits and how much will it help me save on my taxes? So donations actually in the Canadian tax system have a huge impact. The first $200 of donations have a small impact. Every dollar gets you 25 cents back in taxes and that's in Alberta. Different provinces have different provincial rates. So if I throw out a percentage, I'm talking about Alberta. Um, on the high end, though, once you've surpassed $200, every dollar of donation is a $0.48 cent reduction in taxes, nearly half. So if you make a $1,000 donation, your taxes can be reduced by nearly $500. Wow. Are there some potential tax implications when it comes to buying or selling a home? Absolutely. There is a lot to be aware of. With the skyrocketing prices in uh, BC and in Ontario, and with more and more house flippers, the government's introduced a new rule. Every time you sell your home, you need to fill out a form declaring that you sold it. You need to then declare the years that you lived in it and which ones of those you're, you're going to choose to be your principal residence years. For most of us, one home is not a big deal. Anybody who has multiple homes, you can only choose each year one time. When you do that, then the gain on your property is tax-free, like we're used to. When you sell a home, there's no taxes. But if you have more than one property, it's something to, to be aware of. And even if you've only ever lived in one property, that form is mandatory. You need to make sure you fill it out. So if you have a, a parent who passes away, you inherit the house. You're the executor and you're the sole heir. Let's say you have a house. Now, that parent's home is their main residence. Do you have to pay capital gains on that home? So what happens when somebody passes away is everything that they own is taxed on their final tax return as if they sold it. What that means is that it's as if the individual who was living there sold the home and then just repurchased it at the current value. So they get to claim their principal residence, no taxes. It is then goes through the will to the beneficiary of the will at the new value. So the beneficiary of the will gets the property at its 
market value to date. It's one of the ways in the Canadian tax system we don't have an inheritance tax. On passing there's tax, when you inherit something, you own it free and clear of tax if your executor made sure the taxes were paid. Okay. Now, any tax advice to landlords who maybe rent out their basement suite or rent out another home? First one, make sure you're reporting your income. That's the biggest thing to be aware of. Always, always, always report the income. Even if it seems small, even if it doesn't feel like you made a dollar, report it. The second thing, mortgage payments, only the interest is deductible, not the entire payment. The third one is unless you have a strong reason to do so, I do, we do not usually recommend that you claim the capital cost allowance on that second home. The CCA or capital cost allowance is the depreciation of the home. We recommend not claiming it because if you do, it eliminates future tax planning possibilities with that property. So how long should a person really hang on to their tax documents? I've heard up to what, 10 years? Or do we need to hold on to them that long? So the minimum that we recommend is seven years. Three years are always available to the government and to the courts to go and look at. If they look at those three years and have proof that you made a significant error, they can open up another three years. Then that seventh year is just to be safe. There have been some cases where they look back further than that, but we usually recommend at least seven years. Now, the one exception to that is if you purchase property, if you purchase property and you still own it, hang on to those documents until seven years after you have sold the property. Purchase documents you always want to hold on to. Jaden, what advice would you give someone thinking about investing in an RSP or a TFSA? That's another one of those really big questions, like that corporation versus sole proprietor. There's a lot of decision that goes into that. Our RSPs are fantastic tax planning tools and they're really useful, but they're not always the right choice. Our RSPs give us a credit based on our current tax rate. So if we have higher income, the RSP benefit is also higher. Conversely, if we have lower income, the RSP benefit is actually lower. And that's where a TFSA may be more valuable. It's a difficult decision to make at a, at, on a quick whim. I would highly recommend talking to your financial advisor or to an accountant to get some advice on that because every situation is unique and one might be better for you than the other. Now, Jaden, this year, the CRA is including a Canadian digital news media tax credit. Can you explain what that is? So the Canadian government has made a decision to help support news media. In that, what happens is if you subscribe to a digital subscription to a qualified Canadian journal, journalistic organization, it is a you can report on your tax return and get a tax credit up to 15% of what you pay. So if you pay $100 over the year for uh, your news subscriptions, you get a $15 reduction in your taxes. Might only, you might be thinking, oh, it's only 15 bucks, but hey, it's 15 bucks still in your pocket and not the government's. Uh, the government has not been super clear on which organizations qualify. If you just do a quick Google search of the Canadian digital tax news media credit, you'll be able to see some of their guidelines as far as what they would like to see before you go ahead and claim that. A lot of quality insight here. Jay Nevinson is a Lethbridge Charter professional accountant and a partner with Volution LLP. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. Happy again to do it. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks so much for watching.